Sangay <laughs> Rola penche sange jupa sho sange churan so ki churamba janchu padu dane kapsuchi dagi jin so ki pe sonam ki rola penche sange jupa sho and just letting that motivation sink in that we listen to these teachings that we think about these ideas, that we attempt to practice them in order to develop into our fullest potential. And in that way, being of greatest benefit to all living beings. Okay. So just a very brief review, this perfection or paramita means going beyond the end or reaching perfection. And when these practices, generosity, ethics, patience, joyous effort, concentration, wisdom, when they're done with this bodhicitta motivation, these practices take us beyond samsara to Buddhahood, where all obscurations have been eliminated and all good qualities have been developed limitlessly. So these are not just nice ways to live. These are ways to create momentum, good karma, mental energy, which will actualize in our mind being fully perfected and are also nice ways to live and will create temporary happiness, good relationships, stress relief in the immediate. But the point is not about the immediate. The point is about the long term the immediate issues get solved kind of as a side effect or a byproduct. And the idea is this reaching perfection or going beyond the end, this is an expansive attitude to make us have an inspired mind. It's an aspiration. So it's not trying to be perfect. It's not perfectionism because that would be a terrible idea. <laughs> yeah, it's not trying to be good. It's not so simplistic. What it's about is realizing that the problems in your mind and the problems in your life and the problems in your body are not you. They have a cause, that cause can be removed. All that is comfortable and pleasant and joyful and compassionate and kind and wise can be developed and expanded and deepened to its fullest extent. And that is our potential, that is our nature. And so we practice these things in order to grow into that. And that's why we do them. Not out of shoulds, not out of a sense of I am bad and must be good. Nothing so simplistic, nothing so setting ourselves up for failure. It's really to lift us. And when we have that big picture attitude, it's much easier to cope with the everyday stresses because they're within a context and a framework. If today is all you're thinking about, the troubles of today are a big deal. If you're thinking about the big picture and the long term and what do you want in terms of meaning and purpose in your life, then you can weave everything of your everyday life into that, pleasant or unpleasant. So that's why we do these things. So we've already done generosity. Um, just to quickly review, this perfection was divided into four. So it's the intention to give from a Buddhist perspective, right? It's not, you know, being a grand philanthropist so that you can have your name on a plaque. From a Buddhist perspective, it's this intention, this open heartedness. And there's the obvious giving of property or material support, but then deeper is giving of Dharma, timely advice when appropriate. Then there's giving refuge, which is giving freedom from fear, creating safe space, being non-judgmental, all those kind of things. That's incredible generosity. And then there's giving active love or maitri. So this is generosity from a Buddhist perspective. 
And we've talked about that in previous classes and you can have a look at those previous classes if you're curious. So then we did ethical discipline and ethics or morality from a Buddhist perspective is an attitude of abstention that turns your mind away from harming and the sources of such harm. So it includes the motivation, which is the 10 abstentions that eliminate the 10 non-virtues. So not killing, not stealing, not engaging in sexual misconduct, not lying, avoiding divisive speech, harsh speech, idle gossip, covetousness, ill will, wrong views, these things. But there were also those three divisions, um, refraining from negative, destructive actions, performing positive, beneficial actions, and working for the welfare of sentient things. So that's where we ended last week. And um, were there any thoughts or questions about those before we do anything new? Were they fairly clear? Hi, um, I, I had a question about uh, last um, last week. I had a question, and you, you remember you said you write it down. Um, I think I I on the wrong views. Mm. Wrong. What was wrong views? I I don't get it very well. I think wrong views in the Buddhist the, um, uh, matter is um, to take something that is uh, not permanent for permanent or is it is it right? Wrong view, it's about uh, not knowing that karma and dependent ar uh, dependence arising is real. Wrong views is a big category. So wrong views is one of the mental non-virtues. And wrong views is this big umbrella category, which doesn't mean being confused. It's not about being confused. It's about thinking wrongly, believing wrongly. And the bigger one, the main example that we give is having doubt about cause and effect, but not just kind of ambivalence, but really thinking the opposite of what is true. So for example, thinking that being negative and destructive and selfish and working for your own welfare will lead to happiness. That's yeah. a wrong view, right? That's, um, wrong. that's a wrong view. And, you know, and it's hard if someone has been brought up to have that kind of like selfish ambition to shake them out of it because they might be getting the conditions for happiness by living in that way but it's conditions, not causes, and the piper's got to be paid, right? It's going to come around at some point, and that very behavior is actually the cause of suffering. It's just that they might be accumulating conditions for temporary happiness as the result of that non-virtuous activity. So wrong view is, is a mistaken ideas about cause and effect, mainly. So, this, so you've breached your ethics. What do you do? You practice that you think is the representative of your spiritual refuge that is the embodiment of your core values like wisdom compassion these things and then from there you connect with your motivation yeah, and your motivation is i want to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings and I have confidence that that's possible because I have confidence that the mind can change. You know, it helps if you have mentors or role models or historical figures or spiritual figures that you look up to as an example of what is possible in the human condition. Could you say that one more time that the audio kind of cut out and I had a hard time hearing, if that's okay? Refuge is really shelter, but shelter from what? It's shelter from what your untamed mind will create for yourself in terms of sadness, in terms of afflictions, and in terms of the potential to act in ways that harm others. So it's an internal thing. You know, refuge is internal, but it's based on external observations that change is possible. So it's a tricky thing. Um, and I think that when we're looking at refuge, we don't want to force it. We don't want to, you know, think that we have to be a card carrying Buddhist. I think go back a few steps and ask what has consistently been important to me. When we get to regret the second opponent power, this is recognizing a fault to be a fault. 
So you're really clarifying to yourself what is actually harmful. You're becoming very specific. Is the way that I speak to people the way I want to keep speaking to people? Is the way that I think about people the way I want to keep thinking about people? Is this actually my heart path that when I'm on my deathbed, I'm going to say those were a good series of patterns and habits? Or will we think, actually, I wish I'd given people the benefit of the doubt. I wish I hadn't held so many grudges. I did nothing for my family harmony by thinking about how problematic they were. I just made myself ill with stress and worry. You know, it's, it's really kind of doing that deep dive into regret that is clean, that's not overly identified, that's not guilt. Yeah, and so it's so vital for us to understand the difference between regret and guilt, because guilt is not what's being asked of us. Yeah. So you just kind of scan through the 10 non-virtues and you ask yourself, what have I been coming up with? <laughs> Yeah, what's been going on? And, you know, you look at, all right, well, I've not been a mass murderer, you know, today. That's well done, tick. Um, but when I was cleaning, was I careless with life? You know, when I was cleaning, did I kind of like wipe over some ants or where I, was I vacuuming up some spiders? Like, what is my relationship with the lives of others? And just doing a check, you know, like, okay, maybe since meeting Buddhism, I've been pretty good, but... There were some years there where it was a bit dodgy. All right, just notice that. Regret, yeah, because the regret itself helps change the habit. Whereas guilt is almost like you're deciding the heaviness of your heart and the pain that you feel about doing it is the price you pay to keep doing it. <laughs> well, I feel bad about it. So I'll just keep doing it. You know, it has nothing to do with change. It's like, I'll just beat myself up, but then keep doing the same old thing. Regret is asking you to change, but it also is based on the assumption that you can, that this isn't you, that this is you falling off your path, that this is a mistake. It's a whoops, not a, something to whip yourself with. Yeah, so you scan down and you're like, all right, stealing. You know, what's been my relationship with the possessions of others? Do I take community property for granted? Do I harvest things from the internet that I shouldn't? Have I been embezzling at work? I don't know what y'all get up to, but you just check in. That's not ideal. I'm going to not do that, etc. So you go down the list just as an exercise of self-awareness, and you start to notice, are there patterns? Are there things that happen a lot? You know, you might be doing quite well with all of them, except when you're tired, when you're hungry, your speech becomes harsh. It might be true, <laughs> but it's harsh. It's got the wish to wound. Or when you're a bit, you know, at low blood sugar, <laughs> yes, a little low blood sugar, or you're a little bit um, overscheduled, then your mind goes to covetousness and everything related to attachment and you self-soothe with attachment objects and you just kind of fall into the Netflix vortex or the like scrolling thing or you neurotically text everyone you know trying to get someone to entertain you or you know that that's your default and so that doesn't make you bad it makes you self-aware to know that because then you can start working on it. So sort of hiding yourself from yourself does not help you purify or change. But sometimes when we say, I need to stop doing that, we trigger deprivation. Yeah, and we trigger a sense of, but then what? Well, then how will I be happy? How will I be entertained? How will I be soothed? So we need to be thinking in terms also of, what can I replace this with that is positive, that is of benefit to others? Or can I start making peace with space and spaciousness? And what if I let myself be bored a little bit sometimes? Because the end of boredom is the beginning of creativity and inspiration. You know, if you sit still for five minutes being bored, it's really uncomfortable. But after about five minutes, you start thinking of, oh, I meant to do that and that and this and this. And then, you know, you make your to-do list, put it to one side. And then you start thinking, oh, I was going to write that one letter, or I was going to work on that, or I was going to return to this. 
and just, you know, there's possibilities opening back up. A lot of this is this really deep exercise in self-awareness. Yep, and you can find that in the ethics section of the Lamrim Chenmo, um, as well as the karma section, I think refers to it as well. And if you just do a good Google search, 10 non-virtues Buddhism. Um, yeah, John, go ahead. Um, how does that differentiate from the five precepts or does it? Hmm. The five precepts are intentional vows you make. Mm -hmm. The 10 non-virtues are non-virtuous, whether you have a vow not to do them or not. Whether you're Buddhist or not, these are things that accumulate negative karma. Yeah, regardless. The precepts are proactively preventing yourself from doing the coarsest of these. So vowing not to kill, vowing not to steal, vowing not to lie, vowing not to engage in sexual misconduct. And then the branch is refraining from intoxicants. Not because intoxicants are a natural misdeed, they're not. Intoxicants aren't bad by nature, but under their influence, it's easy to break the other four. <laughs> Right. So those five are something you decide and you promise. And that means that every second of every day, you're refraining. Yeah, rather than just incidentally not causing trouble, you're intentionally preventing harm, which means that you're accumulating so much positive karma every second of every day. So that's one of the big reasons why we take vows is there's just so much positive karma because something that was just kind of an incidental thing now becomes intentional and that really gives power to it. So they're related, but they're not the same. Thank you. Yeah. Yep, so we've got um, refuge and regret, clear enough. So then we get the remedy, which is the countermeasure. So it's something to shift the pattern. So say for example, you, lied about something, you tell the truth about something. Say you were divisive and you were, you know, telling the truth, but it was in a divisive way. And you were saying to one coworker, guess what this third coworker did? And look at how they're so incompetent. Look at how they mismanaged their time and blah, 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 blah. And it's all true, but you're saying it not to solve the problem. You're saying it because you want this third party to like you better or to think worse of them. A plan to split. So the way you remedy that is you think, what are ways I can be a harmonious influence in this workplace, for example? What's ways I can speak well about people so that they'll soften towards each other? You know, how can I encourage others to give people the benefit of the doubt? And you make a proactive plan tomorrow at lunch when I see Susie or whoever it is, I'm going to say something really nice about Bruce, who I was bad mouthing yesterday. And it's going to be true. And it's not going to be cringy. It's not going to be super sugary sweet and icky. It's going to be a valid thing that I've seen him do that I think is good. And I'm going to find an opportunity to share it as my remedy. Yeah, so it's a countermeasure. If you don't want to do a countermeasure that's so one by one, you can do this Vajrasattva visualization or the simplified version of white light flowing down. So you visualize Vajrasattva at the crown of your head or white light at the crown of your head. And then the white light flowing down and through you like an internal shower, soothing and shifting and purifying and your body becomes like clean and clear like crystal. Yeah. And as you kind of get that visualization happening, you add the mantra to that. And what's happening is by visualizing and by speaking and then by thinking, you're engaging body, speech, and mind in a positive way. It's a countermeasure. Body, speech, and mind were up to no good. Now you're just changing the energetic pattern, aren't you? body, speech, and mind. So Om Vajrasattva Hum is the short Vajrasattva mantra. There's a long one too, but the short one will get you started. So I, I have a question about, um, I think the, the refuge in the Vajrasattva type of purification practices and those things kind of go together for me. Um, I, I did a Vajrasattva initiation and I never finished all of the, the mantra pieces. And um, you know, I think for me sometimes as this like, you know, very 
middle class white woman growing up in the middle of Santa Cruz, um, sometimes I bite off these amazing pieces and I think, well, great, I'd like to be purified. And then I get into the middle of them and I also feel like, wait, we've also been advised to really hold to doing the things that feel true. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I get into some of these things and um, I wouldn't necessarily call it doubt, but maybe, um, you know, as we get into the parts that, um, um, I, 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 I mean, absolutely no disrespect. So I'll speak in the way that it's coming to my brain, but please absolutely understand that there's no disrespect in it. It's a true, genuine desire to understand. Um, but those parts that feel a little more shamanistic to me that I don't really. And so I, I'm kind of now in the middle of it and I'm like, wow, well, have I just damned my soul for not following through? <laughs> and yet at the same point, um, held back a little, you know, COVID happened. I didn't really have a teacher to, to bring all those things through. So in go my mind, the then when I go back to refuge, I just go back to, in my core and in my spirit, I want to be as Buddha was like, that's, that's kind of where I go. But then when we get into those places where we we're doing these things, I mean, they sound lovely. I feel lovely when I do them, but I don't truly understand what I'm doing. What should I do? How far, how far do you go when you truly don't understand any of it? And you're like, well, that sounds like a Sunday picnic. Why don't I go see what <laughs> And taking it yep. on in a deeper, meaningful way, but not, not really understanding what I'm doing. And then backpedaling because I don't really there's it. ambivalence and it's and you're being honest about your ambivalence and that is very healthy and encouraged as you know but there's also the ambivalence that comes with um I don't understand and I'm really busy so I'm going to just not research it because my life is busy so I'll tell myself my reason for stopping is because it reminds me of something I don't like or I don't get it and that's a Western thing that we do. And my, my own teacher, Kensa Rinpoche Geshe Teshi Sering says, I don't understand is not a correct reason to stop. <laughs> I don't understand is a reason to study. <laughs> yeah. Like, of course you don't understand. Why would you understand? You know, you haven't learned it yet. It's not an intelligence issue. It's nothing to do with that. It's just, you haven't come across this information in a way that makes it sink in for you yet. So there's no problem. You just, you know, haven't found the right sources to make you go, oh, that's why. And then once you understand that's why, then you decide yes or no. We kind of use the I don't understand as our criteria for yes or no. Yeah, the criteria for yes or no should be I understand it. Now I decide agree, disagree. And so certainly agree or disagree, but research it well enough to know what it is exactly you're agreeing or disagreeing to. So that's one piece. The other piece is that there are some things that are gonna take a while to understand or take a while to connect with in a deep experiential way. And how long do you go before you kind of say, it's too soon for me or not right for me or the gap is too big. And that is a personal decision but I would say that there is a very basic psychology and it's reinforced in the joyous effort section of the Lam Rim, which we'll come to soon. But there's a thing about if you start something, it's helpful to finish. It's good for your mental habits. You know, it's a little bit like the psychology of why Buddhists are not really that fussed about something like divorce, except for when you break a promise, it's easier to break promises. You know, so if you do it, you know, you think about it really well and you decide, all right, we're different people now than the people that got married. It didn't work. All right. It's just let's really, you know, think about it, try to reconcile, do our therapy. And if it still doesn't work, OK, we're going to dissolve it. But it's not done lightly because breaking a promise makes other promises easier to break. So even tiny ones like I'm going to do 100,000 Vajrasafa mantras, <laughs> if you stop, you know, halfway through it kind of ruins the momentum of you taking on a mission of a spiritual goal. Yeah, but 
you know, sometimes we take these things on before we know how big they're going to be. And it's, it's important to kind of give yourself permission to pick something back up, but in a smaller version, a smaller version. So if you're saying, I want to do this 100,000 Vajrasattva mantras to purify all my lifetime's negative karma, it's kind of a big task you've set for yourself. So why don't you just do three a day <laughs> and just tally them and just kind of keep it in the, I guess, in the basket of I'm changing my mental habits and I'm using sacred sound to change internal energies. And whether I believe that or not, I do believe that thinking differently in a repetitive way helps. So I'm going to choose this format because why reinvent the wheel? I have faith enough and reason enough and context enough to kind of keep going with it. But I'm not going to put so much pressure on the quote goal of finishing the tick lists and finishing the numerical counts. And I'm just going to take it really gently day by day and think of it in terms of daily practice, not finishing something. Does that make sense? Does that help? Yeah, that's that's very helpful and and a nice um, clarification on some of that practice as well. And um, Vajrasattva comes up at many centers. Keep your ear to the ground. <laughs> Keep your ear to the ground. Um, in the meantime, tantric path of purification. Find that little sucker online. That will help. Tantric path of purification or becoming Vajrasattva. It's a really good text and it might help give you a bit of oomph. Yeah. Um, yeah, Charity? So I've just realized um, that in a personal situation, I, I often have to interact with somebody who is perhaps a narcissist. So I am having a feeling of regret because I called, I called him a liar recently and it's turned into a huge thing because what he was assuming about me was so reprehensible to me that I said, you're lying. You know, you're saying I feel a certain way. And, um, but now I recognize that as a fault in myself because I'm trying to call him out for how he's making me feel. But now I'm wondering how does one, you know, if I say, oh, I'm so sorry, I called you a liar. And I know he's going to be like, yes, I'm vindicated. I am, uh, she's so, she's aware of how awful she is and how, um, you know, how horrible she was to me. <laughs> Do you understand my quandary here? <laughs> well, well, the question is, um, but you weren't lying, right? Like they were, they were lying and you told them that they were, and that was true. It just wasn't skillful, right? Because you telling someone that they're a liar is not going to make them go, oh, am I? I'm so sorry. Thank you for pointing that out. Adjustment, <laughs> you know, right? Like it wasn't like you were wrong. It was just not skillful, right? Because since when does that work, <laughs> right? Yeah. People have to feel so safe to admit to wrongdoing. People have to feel so accepted and so confident that they won't be exiled from the herd to admit to wrongdoing or else, so have, my, you know, so, so you know that, you know, while you were right, it was the wrong approach. So if I apologize to him, he's not <laughs> understanding that it's me trying to, you know, improve my own reactions. So it's almost like, do I just, mm -hmm give him what he wants or not, I don't know. But well, this the, 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 the bigger question is, do you wanna keep a relationship with someone like that? Or is the relationship inevitable and you have no choice? Those are things to check out first, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if you wanna keep a relationship with this person or you have no choice because they're in, their in your family and you see them all the time, that's one strategy. The other strategy is, they're not healthy for you. You're not healthy for them. It's a mishmash of unhealthiness. You know, wish them well and say goodbye. That's a different strategy. So it's like, you know, you're, you're trying to fix an immediate situation, which is rep representative of a much bigger issue, I'm guessing. Yes. So take it back a few steps and ask, what do I actually want to happen here? What Thank is you. possible here? And then you get strategic. Yeah, but yeah, Mar, my heart goes out to you. That is not the funnest kind of relationship to navigate. <laughs> yeah. I sure did. Um, I, I apologize if this is basic, but who is, is it Vajra Sana? Is that how you pronounce his name? Vajra Sattva. Vajra Sattva, okay. 
And there's a few guided meditations on Vajrasattva um, that you can find online, short versions, long versions, lots of versions. So lots of guided meditations on him if you're curious. We've done, we've had a look at these, then we get to resolve. And this last piece has to be really personal and really practical. Yeah, personal and practical. So it's a time specific promise to oneself and the Guru Buddha Vajrasattva <laughs> about one will what one will refrain from in the future and for how long specifically. And you just think in terms of something physically, verbally, mentally that you're gonna work on and how. So you just kind of sit with, maybe you're purifying just one day or maybe you're purifying something that happened a long time ago or a pattern, it's totally up to you. But you can think, all right, what's something I really wanna purify and I've done my refuge regret remedy. Now I'm looking at say harsh speech. All right, so I can't say I'm never going to have harsh speech again. Yeah, you can't say that, it's not true. You don't have enough mindfulness to catch yourself for the rest of your life in that habit, yet. <laughs> you will, but not yet. So if you say that to yourself, you'll inevitably fail, feel bad about yourself, give up on the whole practice and flood with shame or some variation, right? This is what we do. So what you say to yourself is, tomorrow until lunch, I will not. Yeah, it's specific. And the next morning you really remind yourself, today I'm being really conscious of harsh speech and I'm gonna do nothing with even a whiff of harsh speech until lunch. <laughs> and hopefully after lunch and hopefully until the rest of my life, but really I'm focusing on the goal of lunch because that's how long I can stay mindful for. And once I get to that goal, I can rejoice and think, yeah, I did it. And the four opponent powers are complete and that negative karma is purified. It will not bring you the result of suffering in the future. That seed is done. Yeah, it still has, you know, the ability to give you projections of the appearance of inherent existence, but that's a longer conversation. It can't give you suffering once the four opponent powers have been purified, yeah, and applied. So this power of resolution, just time specific, honest, really gentle. If you're really angry at someone and you're like nurturing ill will and you're just like in a rage and you know you need to purify it, but you're still really grumpy, you can say for the next five seconds, <laughs> I will not be nurturing ill will. And for that five seconds, you might have to say, oh, money, pay me, oh, money, pay me, oh, money, pay me, oh, money, pay me, oh, to keep your mind protected from that. But it's like a circuit breaker. It interrupts the momentum of the negative habit and pattern. And it's a very effective psychology. And it's also a very deep spiritual practice, both. I just remember the other night that as a child, we would kill fleas mm. on our animals. So like, I mean, hundreds of thousands, right? Yeah. So I get all of them except the resolve. I haven't, I don't, we used to call it picking fleas. Mm. I don't pick fleas anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know what, what to resolve. Well, will you do it again? No. So you can resolve, I will not do it again. Well, that's it. That's it. Finished. Oh, okay. Done. Um, remedy could be, you know, go to the fishing store and buy some bait worms who are destined to go on hooks and they're, you know, kind of half alive frozen little wormies and you just take them to your garden and set them free. <laughs> you know, for example, you can do Vajrasattva mantra as your remedy too, yeah. you know, but you can do some act of saving life if that kind of helps your inner process. But the power of resolve, as you say, that act of killing many, many hundreds of thousands of fleas over my whole childhood and all of my dogs from beginningless time, that is something I don't want to continue. Um, I'm not going to do it for the rest of this life, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. But you might not be able to say that if you have a dog right now. I can. Say yeah, that, you can say that. I am around animals. Yeah. yeah. And so if you can say that, you say that. If you can't say that, you'll say, while I'm working up to that, I'm going to do something intermediate, like prevent parasites, mm -hmm. like uh, encourage them to move on with various natural remedies. You know, you get strategic, but the point is you have to be honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. And if it's something really epic, like, you know, for example, at the nunnery um, in Ch at Chenrezig in Australia, where I used to live, 
our houses were forever being consumed by white ants, um, termites. And, you know, for us, the lives of those termites were more important than the structural integrity of the building. And we just had to say goodbye to some buildings and then rebuild them with more termite prevention right. and more engineering to prevent that in the future. Right. Some people might not have the financial ability to do that. They might ha not have the sense of safety to be able to do that. And they decide I'm gonna bomb the house and you know get rid of all the termites. And that is not the ideal choice, but they know that they're gonna make it. Uh -huh. So then they do a remedy of, I'm gonna do a medicine Buddha puja on behalf of all of those lives before the term exterminator comes, I'm going to tell the, the termites it's going to happen and I encourage them to leave. Maybe some of them will understand. Occasionally they do, you never know. Or just they, they feel the anxiety and they're like, I don't like this house anymore, I'm going. But um, that's my woo-woo-ness talking, yes. Um, <laughs> so say they all stay, you kill thousands of termites, you know it was the wrong thing to do, but you did it anyway. That's the important piece. Mm -hmm. You're not saying it was the right thing to do and I'm justifying it in this way. No, you're saying it was the wrong thing to do. And someday I'm not gonna make choices like that. Mm -hmm. But right now I am. Mm -hmm. And the, the reasons make sense and are practical to me in my life right now. Mm -hmm. But moving forward, here's what I'm gonna do to prevent killing and taking of life of all forms. And for these beings here, I'm gonna do something for them on their behalf, like a puja. Mm -hmm. Medicine Buddha puja is great for animals. Mm -hmm. Lots of mantras, stuff like that. So it's one of these things where it only works if it's honest. Mm -hmm. And if you're not to your ideal yet, know that. Don't pretend to be otherwise. It's fine, we all are growing. So you just kind of work up to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, other thoughts? I will, I will always, you know, put prevention on my enemy, but there is no other way of, you know, living with it. Well, that's something to examine, right? There is always a choice. It's just a choice you don't want to make. And so then you're honest about that. You say, I could choose for there to be fleas on my dog and fleas in my house and fleas in my life. That is a choice you could make. You're choosing for that not but to happen. To other animals more miserable and more sick. At the, yeah, right, like these are the choices we have to make. Yeah, and I think preventing parasites with whatever measures is a really good thing, but having pets is problematic for our karma for sure, but it's also beneficial to our karma because we're supporting the life of a living being and giving them lots of imprints, right? Your choice to support the health of one being by taking life of another being is not one karma, it's two. Yeah, you're having the positive karma of looking after the one being and the negative karma of taking the life of the others. It's two seeds. One will result in happiness, one will result in suffering. And we just gradually try and make the best choices we can. But we're realizing that they are choices. Um, I was wondering how would one resolve or come to resolve uh, the, with the non-virtue of covetousness? For me personally, with the, 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 the mental things, the things in the mind uh, are sort of a little more difficult for me personally. Um, because when yeah. thoughts come up automatically, um, you know, when the intention is to not have those thoughts, I, I wonder, uh, I was hoping you get some carry on that. Thank you. The, the intention to not have a thought might be too soon. The intention can be not to feed the thought, right? So you have the habitual thought arise of whatever sort of, you know, covetousness, fantasy, you know, extravaganza in your mind, and you say, normally I give in in this way and let it play out or feed it or add elaboration. And for the next five minutes, I'm going to fill my mind with things that I feel joyful about rather than things I'm hungry for, you know? So instead of like an internal hand slap of don't think that, don't think that, you know, that's not what we wanna do and that's not useful right? Like it doesn't work. It's not useful. And it's not what we're about. Don't, don't hit yourself on the hand internally. Don't think that, <laughs> right? Say instead for the next five, 10 minutes, I'm going to think about this positive, joyful thing to start to rewire myself, to start to turn the edge into things that are more productive, kinder, more useful, more expansive for humanity, filling with the positive. 
Or you could think, what is the suffering underneath this covetousness that needs to be addressed? Like, what is the pain that this seems to soothe? You know, is it a loneliness? Is it a grief? Is it whatever? And just kind of like go under and do a little check-in and like, what needs to be nurtured in you? And if that's nurtured, maybe the covetous habit just kind of falls away naturally and you don't even have to do anything about it because you're, you know, getting a need met. So it's, it's sort of just making sure you're not ever having a punishing attitude towards yourself and that you're never looking down on yourself. Yeah, all of our choices make sense given our context, every single one of us. So it's just always start there. You are not bad. <laughs> there is nothing bad about you. There is an innate ignorance, which has made us misbehave. <laughs> yeah, innate ignorance has made us misbehave. We can overcome that ignorance with wisdom. Thank you. Yeah, yes, good questions, guys. And we add rejoicing because it's no good to just think about all the ways you've slipped off your path. Think about how you've stayed on your path, yes. So you do some rejoicing for yourself and your own positive actions. Yeah, you're thinking, do you know what? I have been kind and generous today in this and this chapter of the day. I've really had positive focus in this and this aspect of the day. And you're just reassuring yourself there are positive habits already. And they're growing and being nurtured, especially when more and more intention is applied. So you end with a lift. Yeah, you don't wanna end with a, here's the things I have to do to be good. You know, that's not <laughs> helpful, right? Or here's all of my plans and promises to add to my to-do list, oh, vey. you know, that's not useful. End on a lift. And then you expand and you think about the positive things people are doing in your life. And this kind of helps you, in a way, orient yourself to what is good in the world that you want to be a part of, that you want to support. From a karmic perspective, when you rejoice in other people's positive actions, it increases your positive karma. You don't even have to do anything extra. You just think how wonderful it is that there are as doctors without borders. That's really fantastic what they do. Like rejoicing in that is positive karma. You know, it's amazing, but it also uplifts your mind that the world's not just going to hell, like good stuff is happening. Um, you can even consciously think of people in your life who are like enemies or people who you really do not like and try and think of good things that they're doing. Like, look, I don't like them, but they're nice to their mother, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just like take a minute. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, then you think about strangers and, you know, people who have work and lifestyles that you really respect and are inspired by, and then all sentient beings, you know, maybe you think about animal realms and how they take care of each other or live more lightly on the land, that kind of stuff, expanding, expanding. And then you end with the good actions that Buddhist bodhisattvas and gurus are doing. This can remind us of what's possible. This can reinforce our connection with them and the support we want from them. Um, all of this is really useful work. So this is the rejoicing practice. It can be done just on its own. It doesn't have to be done together with purifying. It's just a really good time for it to add it at the end of your purification. And then you dedicate and a, you know, a standard dedication to actualize bodhicitta, good to add to realize emptiness as well because if you're remembering that everything is empty of inherent existence, then you're knowing that nothing stands alone and is good or bad in and of itself, divorced from context. So if you end with realizing emptiness dedication, it kind of seals it and prevents it from fundamentalism. Yeah, you're remembering the way nothing is independent. This also protects your positive karma from being destroyed by anger in the future. Because that's kind of the question, like there's purifying negative karma, which destroys it from giving you suffering, but can you destroy positive karma so it can't give you happiness? Yeah, you can. <laughs> you can destroy positive karma. Oh no, that's terrible news, but you can. How do you destroy positive karma? Anger and wrong views mostly. So it's kind of, it helps to protect your merit by remembering emptiness at the end of a practice. Yeah. 
does that feel kind of comfortable that practice that you could you know walk yourself through those steps if you wanted to if you're feeling purification would help and it would strengthen your ethics and change your negative habits if you wanted to do it you could yeah Paige, go ahead oh <laughs> thank you so much um i really appreciate this teaching so much because um one of the things that tends to go through my mind anyway is that i've done deeds that i regret from the past which had to do with divisive speech and, and, and harsh speech and so on and or i tend to get into this mindset that it's because of that harsh speech and that divisive speech that I'm in the situation I am in today. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of punish myself with that thought. It's like, because you were, you know, because I was ignorant and not careful and indulging in what I thought was a powerful way of expressing myself, I'm now suffering from, from that. And I think what you're trying to say is that you don't need to use that as a kind of a, a whip to, to whip yourself with. If you've done things wrong in the past, you can do the, the four pointed powers and you can just express regret for having done it and apply the remedy and resolve never to do it again. Yeah. And I think that's so important. And I also think the rejoicing is extremely important because there's almost a sense of, you know, it's, it's wonderful because you're not doing it anymore. It's wonderful yeah. that you can move, to the for, move forward to the future. And it's not going to be an issue. It's gone. Yeah. Once you've done the, the whole process of going for refuge, feeling regret and applying the remedy, I think that's extremely important. And then there's a lightness to it. It's like, yeah, it's okay. It's in the past. Yeah. It's something yeah. that happened out of ignorance. And then you, when you broaden your scope, you realize everyone is doing this. Everyone is indulging in these kinds of activities. And it's very common, it's very widespread, and it's happening continuously. The yeah, you're not a unique brand of bad or something. Oh. <laughs> so the wonderful thing is realizing that you've done it and then just moving from there instead of just continually engaging in an, in an ignorant manner, which is what most people tend to do. So they keep coming into work every day making the same mistakes over and over and over. For sure. And, and I think you're, you're touching on a piece of very common misunderstanding in Buddhism, which is you, when something bad is happening to you or happening around you, you are supposed to remember you created the cause for it karmically. And then our misunderstanding is, then I deserve it and I'm bad. When in fact it's, oh, that's why. So if I don't want more of that, I'll stop creating the cost for that. And it's strategic, not mm -hmm. heaviness, not identified with. Mm -hmm. And it's also then an invitation to take it as mind training and say, how can I use all difficulty to train my mind in resilience, in compassion, in understanding the universal human suffering of expanding my heart and understanding sentient beings and why they make the mistakes that they do. It's not a tool for self-harm to acknowledge the difficulties are caused karmically but often that's where we go with it is if this is happening to me it's because i'm bad it's like no it's just mm. you were mistaken and it's made very easy to fall into that pattern of thinking yeah yeah so we'll do that vajrasattva meditation um one more time and then next week we're going to dive into patience and patience is quite quite good fun, quite confronting kind of patience with suffering, physical and mental, and then patience with people, and also patience to do with um, having conviction and momentum in your spiritual practice. So next week is um, patience, and that'll be quite fun. But right now, we'll just do a meditation on Vajrasattva once again, so it's really clear in our minds. So get yourself good posture, straight back. And just kind of balance in such a way that your tailbone particularly is supported so it doesn't feel like too much effort to sit up straight so you're not straining. And we'll start with refuge. 
So visualize above the crown of your head, Vajrasattva Buddha, radiant white, made of transparent light. And if you'd prefer not to see the deity form, if you'd prefer it more simple, just a ball of radiant white light above your head. So whatever it is that you're choosing to visualize, allow it to become stable and very present. And if visualizing doesn't come naturally to you, that's fine. Just have a sense that the Buddha is here with you, bearing witness to this process. And we think, I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my merits from giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. And you can repeat that in your own mind or words to that effect but try and allow the connection to refuge to become real. And with that sense of your refuge object being with you, holding you in their compassionate gaze, with no criticism or judgment, completely understanding why you do what you do, generate the mind of regret that recognizes a fault to be a fault without guilt or identification. And you can think about just today if that's easiest, but let your mind check in with the points at which you've fallen off your path. You can break it down physically, verbally, mentally. Honest with yourself, honest with the enlightened mind, honest but not identified.
And then think of a countermeasure or a remedy. For this session, we'll just use the visualization and the mantra. But if you'd like to add something physical in your daily life or verbal or a mental pattern, something that's the opposite of the mistake, you can make a little plan for that. but think that from Vajrasattva at the crown of your head or from the sphere of white light above the crown of your head comes a stream of white light going down through all the way through your whole body flushing you clean Streams of white nectar light flowing down through the crown of your head, through your whole body, purifying body, speech, and mind. And while you hold that visualization, add the mantra. Om Vajrasattva Hum, 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 Om Vajrasattva Hum. Om Vajrasattva Hum, Om Vajrasattva Hum. And then generate the power of resolve. Just a very tiny, very specific, practical plan of what you will refrain from in the future and for how long. And imagine that Vajrasattva melts into light and dissolves into you, blessing your body, speech, and mind. And then rejoice. 
just one or two things that you've done today that you feel good about, that was in alignment with your path. Some kindness, some act of service. And then try and think of something positive that someone in your life has done. Or several people. And then thinking more generally, something positive happening in the world by people. Whether it's some charitable organization or a profession you respect. and all sentient beings, and the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and Gurus, particularly the act of teaching, of showing methods for people to heal themselves that encourage altruism. And we dedicate, may the supreme jewel bodhicitta that is not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness that is not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. So you can relax your attention. Um, <clears throat> so I think we can call it a night and tomorrow or tomorrow next week we'll do patience um, and then I think maybe Christina has something. Yeah, just really quickly, um, this uh, succession of classes is quite lengthy at the generosity of Venerable Yenten. Thank you so much. Um, there's actually going to be a total of 16 uh, sessions throughout over the, um, all the way through to November. So um, actually December, excuse me. <laughs> um, so being that we're about um, one third through all of the successions, I just want to um, some of the older teacher, um, excuse me, older students, more experienced students have been asking how to make offerings at the end of class. Typically what, what you can do when you're in person in the gompa is go up to the teacher and offer a white kata with a red envelope, which uh, really usually signifies an offering. Um, often people will put an offering inside of the envelope. Offer this opportunity to share in the chat. I know some of you are brand new to Buddhism. If um, don't worry about it. Um, you don't. You don't have to do anything like this. But um, for if you are feeling moved to, um, and you'd like to make an offer of a virtual kata or a red envelope to Venerable Yunten, you can do so by going to PayPal online. And I put the information in the chat. Um, of course, if you're in person, you are invited to do so as well. Um, I'll, I'll only do this once more um, before the end of the class. So we'll do it about every third of, uh, throughout this process because it is quite a lengthy uh, class. So thank you so much, Venerable Yunten, and we appreciate all that you do.
Thank you. Thanks, Christina. Thanks, Land of Medicine Buddha. Thanks, everybody online and here. And uh, see you next week. See you Thank next you, week. Venerable. Thank you, Venerable. Thank you so much.